okay, we're back. This is Think Tech. This is Hawaii, the state of clean energy, right here, right now. And today we're going to talk about electric vehicles because we haven't talked enough about electric vehicles. Everybody should be talking about electric vehicles. And I have proof. Uh, Melissa Pavacek is the executive director of the Hawaii Automobile Dealers Association. So happy to see her here. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Michael uh, Colon um, is, is with the Ulu Pono Initiative, which we love very much. It's a very important organization. It used to be with Hawaiian Electric. Um, but as I said, as you told before the show, four out of five people on Bishop Street have been with Hawaiian Electric. Uh, so anyway, welcome to the show, Michael. Aloha. Thank you. And you, uh, you direct energy at the Ulupolo Initiative. It's a great job. We, we, all, we all want your job, Michael. <laughs> so, you know, uh, why only, only uh, automobile owners, associate dealers, whatnot, um, you know, why, Melissa? You know, you, you've been a public policy person for about 2,000 years. Uh, <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> but the Hawaii Automobile Dealers Association did have a longtime executive director named Dave Rawl, who was doing it for 2,000 years. And he was a strong advocate for the automotive industry and for clean energy in Hawaii. And I'm really pleased and proud to be able to work with 67 new auto dealers in Hawaii. I just came back from the National Automobile Dealers Association show in Las Vegas, which had 14 football fields worth of new cars. So that was pretty exciting. Of the 14 football fields, how many were electric cars? A very large percentage. And you probably know that Hawaii has the fourth highest rate of electric vehicle adoption of any state in the country. And as I talk to automotive dealer association executives like myself from other states and metropolitan areas, I discovered that Hawaii has a lot of good policies in place and a lot of uh, EV adoption as compared to some of my counterparts across the country. So I'm really excited to talk about this today. And I am too, but I want more. I want more cars, more electric cars here. That's the mission. Is that the mission for you, Michael? What 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 connection do you have with electric cars at Ulupano? So Ulupano um, is an impact investment firm focused on um, improving Hawaii in four key areas: uh, renewable energy, uh, clean fresh water, local sustainable agriculture, and then sustainable transportation. And on the transportation front, it covers. Uh, both multimodal and vehicle miles travel reduction, as well as electrification of transportation, which we view as a uh, good synergy to reduce carbon emissions and eliminate our dependence on foreign oil, as well as improve overall grid stability over time. Okay, so the idea is we're going to inquire as to what the situation is. It sounds good, Melissa, uh, and what it can be. Uh, and then how are we going to get there? That that's that's the way I look at it. But first, I want to show a clip that you gave us uh, from some kids here in Hawaii. I wanted to show you this clip because the Hawaii Automobile Dealers Association um, is very concerned about the number of qualified automotive technicians in our state. And in thinking about what some of the challenges and barriers are, to making electric vehicles attractive to car purchasers in Hawaii, of course, it's the ability to get it repaired, uh, the vehicles repaired. So it's maintaining and, and uh, repairing EVs is a component of incentivizing and increasing adoption of EVs in Hawaii. And Leeward Community College and the other community colleges have partnered with HADA, and you're, you're seeing the Leeward Community College amazing students here. And we're um, trying to get the students to work in the dealerships and stay here for these good paying, technology oriented, computer related jobs. And so we've been sending HR professionals into the Leeward Community College to train them on how to be interviewed and match up with good paying jobs. And some of the data that we've seen, like nationally, uh, automotive techs start in the average range of like $40,000 a year, but a good high paying automotive tech here in Hawaii, who is trained and certified in EV and other types of vehicles makes well in excess of $100,000 a year. And recently 
I was told by some dealers they're paying as much as $180,000 a year. So this is really a good opportunity to both build our workforce, educate our kids who will hopefully stay here in Hawaii, and promote EV adoption. Mm, maybe that's why I have to pay so much when I go down for servicing. Mm, never mind. No, I mean, I know we're speaking a little lightly right now and just kind of getting our feet wet and talking about this, but uh, part of the case for why a new car purchaser would want to consider EV is the cost of the vehicle, the cost to repair, and the cost to operate a vehicle. And all of those are really interesting policy opportunities, and the legislature has been doing work um, in all of those areas. And so I know we could talk about that a little bit more, but in terms of building our workforce, that is a key component of ensuring that repairing our vehicles can get done efficiently and effectively here in Hawaii. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. And uh, we, we should have this kind of uh, skill and we should keep up with the technology. Those kids uh, should know not only how to do uh, classical cars, but uh, also EVs, um, which are more specialized. Uh, so if I you know, so add, Jay, um, on that note, in addition to electric vehicles and the repair and maintenance of those, um, we're also ushering in a whole new era of infrastructure as well on the charging side. And we can get further into the needs looking down the road, but there's also a need for charging infrastructure support, installation, repair, and ongoing maintenance as well. So at the same time as training for uh, vehicle techs, which is crucial, we also need to be uh, ramping up our just broader technical expertise and workforce development, skill development for this infrastructure as well, because it's high power. So it, you have to have a certain kind of uh, safety training for electricity, plus it's computers. And so that combination really requires a, a unique skill set in addition to the vehicles, which are also more complicated. So uh, yeah, we, Lupano, we definitely support workforce and skill training uh, to really help usher this in because it will be a growing need going forward. You're bringing up such a good, good and important issue, not just as a workforce issue, though. Infrastructure is a huge focus of what we advocate for at our state legislature because uh, selling a vehicle to a homeowner and if they reside in a multifamily dwelling or an apartment, if they don't have access to charging stations, it is very challenging. And so even if they have a single family home, uh, ensuring that they can charge their vehicle, whether it's at home or at work, and making sure that we're having strategies to expand the vehicle charging stations is really important. And one of the ways that we have asked uh, legislators to consider, and they, they are um, considering different strategies, is to have government lead by example. So very often we see bills or requirements that say uh, the commercial property owners or private residences should have charging stations, but we have the only unified school district in the whole country. And if we had charging stations and, you know, uh, solar PV at all the schools, which I know a lot of schools do, but this would be an, another way for, for government to lead by example. And there are um, definitely policies in place especially with the State Department of Transportation and other governmental agencies to implement clean energy strategies. So I'm, I'm excited and encouraged by that. Well, you know, uh, you know I, I foresee a time, and I have foreseen this for a long time, um, when gas stations, you know, in the traditional sense, are, have, they all have charging stations. Every single one of them has a charging station, maybe multiple charging stations. And then one day, you know, the gas station, like, disappears. This is like the Karl Marxian state. The state disappears, and we have gas stations which only have charging stations on. Um, do you foresee that, Michael? Do you foresee a time when charging stations are ubiquitous? Because right now, although I would say it's hard to feel range anxiety because there are enough, you know, to allay that concern. Fact is, we all feel much better if every gas station, you know, had or turned into a charging. What do you think? So I, I think when we talk about range anxiety, it is important to remember that um, it may not, you may not feel it the same here on Oahu, but places like the Big Island or Maui, where the driving distances are longer, they still do experience range anxiety. And it's kind of 
indicative of a lack of charging infrastructure. And going forward, there will be more charging uh, opportunities in place around the state. And it's a different paradigm because, as Melissa mentioned, there's also a vast majority of people who can just plug in when they go home. So they change their routine. But there still needs to be, well, you know, a backbone of EV charging in the public sphere that is available and accessible for people to leverage if they decide, hey, I want to be spontaneous and go somewhere else and I didn't remember to charge. Or I've been driving a ton and I need to need to charge up before I go home. We need to have those places, those opportunities in place so that people can live their lives as kind of freely as they do now under uh, where gas stations are very ubiquitous. And then on top of it, when Melissa mentioned um, the state leading by example, I completely agree. And there are fantastic opportunities to kind of leverage those school buses at, you know, with solar on the roofs at the schools, with batteries as resilience hubs as well. So when, if a disaster happens, or if, when a hurricane comes, the first thing that people do is they gas up their cars. Well, now you have batteries and you have a need to charge and there needs to be the infrastructure in place to support that resiliency as we kind of shift uh, into a different kind of way of fueling our vehicles. So it's a, it is a fundamental shift in the way people think and behave, uh, but I do see it happening over time. And, and the other thing that Melissa brought up in the beginning about Hawaii being one of the top vehicle adoption states in the country, it's true. And it's been that case. We used to be number two, always behind California. And we did it with relatively fewer incentives than any other state. We have, we're not a ZEV mandate state, meaning we're not part of the, you know, collective of states that have um, aggressively mandated towards electric vehicles. We did it with very little purchase incentives for vehicles. We had one very early on when we first, in the early days of the EVs, but we don't have that anymore. Um, and it went away very quickly. And so with our relatively low in amount of incentives, we've achieved that significant adoption. And I think it has a lot to do with, with the eco-consciousness of the state, but also how it makes sense for the average driver uh, to be more efficient and leverage electricity for uh, their fueling. So I uh, just wanted to say that I, I definitely think Hawaii is going to continue to be on the forefront of... Uh, well, I I wanna I, I, I'd like to before we get to that, I'd like to I'd like to just follow on one point. And that is um, you know, I keep hearing and about the, the reason is people with hybrids are oh, they're so happy because they don't have to get a lot of gas and they don't have to charge up either. The one feeds the other. And so maybe the need for charging stations in the future will change uh, because of hybrids. On the other hand, I don't know a lot of people, you know, who are getting hybrids these days. The ones I know who have them love them. Um, because of that exchange between, you know, the battery and the and the gasoline. Um, but wouldn't that be um, helpful in terms of you know, dealing with the, the charging station issue, Michael? Um, so when you have a hybrid, you essentially have your, uh, you know, quick charger on board your vehicle in the form of the gasoline engine. And so it creates that secondary buffer, which you don't have to worry about um, plug electricity range because you can always rely on your gasoline. So it is a bridge to the future. At the end of the day, from an efficiency standpoint, electric vehicles still are vastly more efficient when it comes to a miles per gallon equivalent. And then the one final thing, and I think it's important worth mentioning or remembering is that we have a renewable portfolio standard in place, meaning that we are eventually going to achieve 100% clean electricity. If you power your vehicle, over time, the power supplying that vehicle will be cleaner and cleaner and cleaner as we get closer to the RPS. Whereas if you have a gasoline vehicle, you will always be emitting and contributing to you know carbon emissions at some level, regardless of whether it's a hybrid or a, um, or not. So. That's just one of those things that, you know, over time, hopefully we'll be able to make our our collective emissions, whether it's at the central station electricity plant 
or at the tailpipe, you know, it's it's cleaner and cleaner over time as a result of our electrification. Listen, you wanted to say something that you said earlier, and it was this vision about not having gas stations anymore. And I just wanted to say, and you kind of said it already, uh, you know, it's hard to have a vision for what will be without unintentionally having some consequences that might not be so good. And so I think hybrids do play a role. And we are now seeing challenges with electric battery recycling. And the state legislature is considering a bill to have an additional study about how do we ensure that the electric batteries, electric vehicle batteries and other um, equipment is appropriately dealt with. And it's not these challenges with shipping them off the island or can we do some recycling here in Hawaii. So I get uncomfortable when we have a vision without and locking in into a particular solution. And I get very comfortable with promoting and incentivizing, educating and, and explaining the benefits. But where I get a little struggle is when we are pre-selecting some of the solutions or driving a policy that might cause other worse problems or significant challenges. So for the Hawaii Automobile Dealers Association, we've been um, observing and commenting that the timing might be going a bit fast on things like our state's road usage charge. So as a policy, we're saying we're going to see more people using electric vehicles. They aren't going to be paying gas taxes to maintain the roads. Instead, we're going to charge them a road usage charge. At the same time, we want to increase, promote, and incentivize use of electric vehicles. And like Michael said, we haven't had to spend a lot of money to do that. But let's not lessen the benefits, not right now, not while we're trying to ramp up. So I think we're really just struggling with some of the timing and the implementation of those policies. I will, yes, I would like to talk about the incentivization and how that works. And your point is very well taken about doing um, you know, road charges uh, uh, when, when you don't don't sell as much gasoline, and you can't tax that. Um, but, but question, you know, it, it, all of this raises, in my mind, a diversification of the electric vehicle portfolio. And one possibility, which, uh, you know, there are organizations like HNEI working on hydrogen, um, and there are hydrogen buses uh, being deployed right now on the Big Island. So query, where does hydrogen fit in all of this? Because it's not the same as a pure EV, is it? Right. Well, we see some bills in this legislature right now to promote um, fleets of government vehicles to be hydrogen. And we definitely have some automobile dealers further exploring hydrogen vehicles. And I just want to ensure that Hawaii has its options open and we don't um, predetermine some results that might leave us on the short end of the stick. What's better? You're asking me to choose among my children, and I cannot answer the question. But I think there's, you know, better than what... That's a really good answer, Melissa. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I just think, you know, there's comparisons, right, on cost of the vehicle, maintain, maintenance, et cetera. And these are the same comparisons we do with uh, combustion engine vehicles, and that over time, the optimal solution is to make things in the best interest of the consumer. And that hopefully will be um, set up in such a way that it is also in the best interest of the state, the world, the planet, et cetera. And um, I think I just see a lot of promise, and I'm really encouraged by the way in which new vehicle purchases are unfolding. And I hope that we will see a continued increase in EV purchases. I did recently receive a report on new auto sales for the last quarter, uh, the end of last year, and the impact of the Maui wildfires on new car purchases in Hawaii has dampened somewhat the, the um, increase in new car sales following COVID. And, you know, there had been a little bit of pent up demand there that we were catching up on last year. And I think we saw a softening of that quite at the end of the year, but uh, expected new growth in 2024. So we're excited. Well, you know, um, there was a time when people wondered whether Hawaii was keeping up on EVs. And, and even now, I think 
some people wonder, although the, the numbers on a, a national comparison sound good, fact is that, uh, what are we at, 15,000, not quite 20,000 uh, EVs in the state? 30,000. 30, 30,000. Yeah, which is still not that much. I mean, in total, when you compare, it's about 3% of the total registered vehicles. Uh, but but there's actually a better story to be told, and I, you know, Melissa, I don't want to, uh, you know, if I'm a little bit off, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I do think um, it's the sales year over year, sales growth of EV, yes. which is a real good story to tell. And it's, you know, um, when you compare 2023 to 2022, um, Oahu and Kauai were around 25% increase in EV sales year on year. And then Maui, the big island, were much bigger. It was uh, around 40% growth. So, I mean, it's pretty significant. When you look at it, it's still a small amount total, but it's growing, and that's that's kind of where you're seeing the action happen. Yeah, and you have to look at how long people are holding their vehicles. So yes, we can have a high rate on the new car purchases, but it's still, you know, it's tough if people aren't going to be turning over a new car for a long time. So are you saying that electric vehicles don't have to be turned over as frequently? No, I'm not saying that. I don't actually know what the data is on that. I'm just saying that if we have, you know. Well, you mentioned classic cars. We can have cars out there for a really long time. That's not, no matter how many new cars we buy, it's still, if you still got your, Jay, you said you were mentioning the 2,000-year-old man. I don't know how old your vehicle is in your car, but I bet it's, you know, more than a year. <laughs> what a true fact. But you know, you know what people say, and I would be interested in how you feel about this, is that um, the batteries don't last all that long. You know, big battery, expensive battery, $5,000 battery, and at some point along the way, the battery's going to go. Uh, it's going to go may maybe uh, within a shorter time than the useful life of an ordinary, you know, uh, classic uh, gasoline car. Uh, what about that? Um, is the technology changing? Are we going to have batteries with longer? You're, you're nodding your head, Michael. I like that. Um, are we going to have batteries with longer useful lives? Uh, or do I have to worry about plunking down $5,000 after five years? So I don't think the batteries are that volatile that they would be useful, not useful after five years. Um, the chemistry has changed. I like to kind of um, use the analogy of battery. The state of battery technology is kind of what computers and microprocessors were in the 80s. We're still in that early phase of trying to, you know, improve efficiencies, and there's a lot more to go. I mean, if you, I kind of, geek out on battery stuff and watch the news on different chemistries and you're seeing all kinds of new um, technologies being tested and tried that are way more uh, efficient and the, those chemistries will be come to market and they will improve those efficiencies not only in terms of the capacity but the life of the battery and the ability and the use of um, materials in, in the building. So I think there's there's a lot to be done. And then as far as the waste stream, we definitely acknowledge that's a, that is a concern. It's interesting, though, because when you think about the waste stream from fossil fuel, right, it's, it's you can't see it, but it's in the air. It's accumulating. We know it's causing problems. When you have a battery, it's a tangible thing. You can see it in front of you. But that's that, that being said, um, the co-founder of Tesla, one of the co-founders went off and started his own battery recycling company. And there's a lot of opportunity there with those batteries because they can essentially take take them apart and pull apart the different materials and repackage it again for new batteries. And so there will be a secondary market, um, whether that happens on Hawaii is a whole conversation. We definitely support you know, uh, looking at that uh, so we can minimize impact on Hawaii and also maybe create opportunities for future, you know, jobs or industry as well related to batteries. But um, it's it's a chain. We're at an inflection point in time with, with transportation. It's really interesting to see and exciting to be part of. Jay, it seems like you're going to need some technical experts to come on and talk to you about some of those things. And I'm glad that we could talk about some of the bigger policy issues. But you know, especially because you invited both Michael and myself to chat with you today, I'm really excited about um, HADA's partnership 
with Ulupono and our support for each other's programs. And we've been exploring uh, doing an EV auto showcase together, highlighting EV vehicles to the community, educating people together, participating in energy conferences together. And I'm just excited about that going forward. Well, you know, it reminds me of something called Better Place. I don't know if you remember that. That that company uh, you could do because it was associated with a fine electric and and so um, I, one remarkable thing, two remarkable things about it. One is you would be able to charge your battery from your rooftop solar, um, and that you wouldn't have to buy additional energy from the utility. That, that was an interesting possibility. The other is that it, it it could create a kind of you know huge extended grid, so that if you had excess energy in your car, you could feed it back into the grid. Uh, which a better place was talking about that. Unfortunately, they're no longer in business, um, but they had some very, really visionary ideas. And, uh, you know, I hope when you do this, uh, the partnership, I'm really looking forward to seeing how it, how it unfolds. Yes, there are two sides. There's the technical side, there's the policy side, you know, and, and there's the, what do I say, the utility and community side of it all connected. And, uh, uh, you know, it, each side touches all the other sides. But Melissa, don't don't sell yourself short. You're in public policy and you know what goes on in the square building. And um, so you know what goes on, you know, every session, you know what goes on about transportation and about energy and, and about electric vehicles. First of all, PADA. PADA is composed of dealers, right, by definition. And yes, those we're dealer, a dealer day at the Capitol, we're going to be meeting with legislators and policymakers coming up in March. And our state director of transportation committed to join us there. And we're going to be talking more. I hope that Michael will join us up there. And Jay, if we could see you at the Capitol, that'd be amazing too. Uh, uh, I want to follow up on that for sure. So, you know, down there with all those people talking about, you know, they used to say that uh, as general motive goes, so goes the nation. That's been transmuted. Uh, first, they were saying, as energy goes, so goes the economy. But now I would say we, a more refined view of that is, as electric cars go, so goes transportation, and thus, so goes the economy. So this is a really central issue for the ledge. Um, and, you know, we, we, could, we could waste money. We could waste our environment. But we could also do the right thing. So my question to you, Melissa, oh, this is such a, I've been waiting to ask you this question. <clears throat> we had... Uh, as Michael mentioned, we had incentives. We had a tax credit here on top of the federal tax credit. And then one day, as if in a puff of smoke, no tax credit, not state, no state tax credit. And it's gone. It's like, it's gone like the super ferry. It's gone. And the question I ask you is, why is it gone? Wouldn't it have been good to keep it? And, and depending on your answer, shouldn't we have it again? You know, I attended a five-hour briefing on the gap in the state budget, and I'm sure the legislators will have a lot to say about that. But I look forward to working with you and talking with you about it in the future, as well as with Michael and the automobile dealers. So I'm not sure I have the answer today. Okay. All right. But all they say is, uh, yes, I'm interested in following up on it. I would like to see it come back. I would like to see Hawaii, the, um, you know, unqualified number one in the country and the world per capita to have more electric vehicles. We are a model and we should be way out there with lots and lots of electric vehicles. And I can tell you there's a lot of people I know that are waiting for this credit. And that's not a matter of money. It's a matter of the state government gives a nod. When the state government gives a tax credit, it's more than the tax credit. It's saying, we believe in this. We want this. We want you to be mm, partner with us about electric vehicles. And when it when it got pulled, you know, the message was other than that. So, um, you know, I, I feel the incentives ought to be replete everywhere. Eh? And I also feel, and let me ask you about this, shouldn't whatever incentives or benefits people get with an electric vehicle, shouldn't that apply uh, to hydrogen vehicles also? You know, like free parking at the airport, they still have, have that, or a certain number of stalls in a given parking lot in a commercial property, if they still have that. Uh, what kind of an, other incentives, aside from tax credits, are we interested in? And are they going to apply? Do they apply across the board? 
Yeah, I think there's a lot there in all of the different buckets we talked about today, including, like we said, maintenance and repair, ease of operation. You identified a few like parking. I think uh, mandating spaces causes some challenges, um, which spaces where and who's going to pay for them. But overall, we'd like to see uh, government support the implementation of um, clean energy vehicles. Sure. Yeah, that sounds amazing. It's a high priority. You know, it's one of those things where government sometimes forget, forgets, you know, what its, what its priorities were and years go by and, and other things come up and the priorities, you know, the political winds change and so forth. Um, but this is something that we should always, always have. So, Michael, you know, what what should we do? What should we do as people who are interested in the future of the state? Um, you know, with, with there's a certain level of resistance, you know, talk to people. Uh, don't you think you should get an electric car? And they say, no, 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 it's, it's not time yet. You know, when, when uh, everything is in place to force me, then I will. But for now, I'm, I'm an old-fashioned gas man. <laughs> you know what I mean? What, what, yeah. what, what should people be thinking what can we do to get them thinking, you know, in a more progressive way? Well, you know, I think um, moving forward, Olupono would support, you know, increased incentives, um, more infrastructure, more charging, deeper integration with the grid so that uh, it's a grid resource. It's a, it's a benefit to the grid as opposed to a, a potential risk to the grid and uh, addressing fleets, uh, converting fleets and other kind of super users that, you know, drive a lot high intensity uh, use of gasoline vehicles. We can target those folks for conversion and really make a dent in uh, emissions. Um, and then, you know, standardizing, it won't happen locally, but the national standardization of the charging standard, there's multiple charging standards, different technologies that'll make investments more efficient over time because you have one standard to build to as opposed to multiples. Um, but really, you know, uh, encouraging the adoption, leading people to make those decisions, um, we believe is crucial to changing, you know, people's minds. The vehicles are great. They, I think they sell themselves. They're fun to drive and, you know, um, I've I've owned one now for many years and um you know have reaped the benefits of being able to uh reduce my um maintenance and ongoing costs of ownership and I think it's those benefits sell themselves but the charging and the infrastructure lay the pathway so that it's more deeply integrated for people uh going forward for our community is is kind of what's needed um going forward you know, you make me think of uh, Martin Luther King, and I have a dream. And I want to tell you my dream for electric vehicles. My dream is that all the vehicles are electric. And if it's mandated, that would be fine. That would get us over the hump. But the other part of it is very interesting, is whether, you know, the buses, the trucks, um, you know, non-personal automobiles are also electrified. Um, that's part of my dream too. Is that part of your dream, Michael? Um, so, and I don't want to get into like a technology debate because I think hydrogen does have a potential. Um, really it's about, uh, decarbonizing, right? Decarbonizing transportation. And, and that's where Ulupona stands is the tie between renewable energy and reducing emissions and making it cleaner and then reducing our impact. Um, so yes, uh, electrification has a large role to play in that. Um, another way to be more efficient is, um, you know, re overall reduction in vehicle miles travel. Vehicle miles travel reduction is energy efficiency for transportation. And, you know, so people can make those conversions or do different things um, and still, participate in society, uh, you know, th those are the things that we, we support and that's a vision for the future too. Um, but, you know, again, when you look at it, whether it's an economic look or, or from a, you know, environment standpoint, we are spending money out of the state, out of the country, uh, for, for fuel, and we can reinvest that locally 
uh, and keep that money here. And there's a lot that can flourish as a result. So, so yeah, love to see that kind of play out over time. Yeah, yeah and it gets more important as uh, geo geopolitical events take place that may affect the availability and uh, the costs and the delivery of fuel. Gee whiz. So I have a big question for you, Melissa. I saved it till the end. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> but I wanted to say, you know, when you said I'm fine with mandating it, it's like, uh, I think as an organization, HADA really struggles. The EPA has certain mandates for EVs on a national level. We're very concerned that they're not really going to be able to be met. And what are the gonna consequences and costs going to be when you mandate things before the the market would would get you there. But let's hear your question, Jay. Okay. Uh, automobile dealers, Mr. Tremendous industry, very important to Hawaii. Um, we, we know who they are. They represent the big car, car manufacturers and so forth. But they're, they're in a, a, a dynamic condition. Um, you can buy a car, including a new car, a used car on the web, and it'll be delivered to your house, bypassing the dealers. Um, and, you know, the dealers have, would have to change their infrastructure, change their way of repairing, like those kids in the clip, um, when, you know, we have more or, automobiles than are electric vehicles. Um, and so it, there must be a tension, if you will, uh, in the automobile dealers community about whether they really want to make the investment in that infrastructure, whether they want to change their marketing, uh, change their maintenance, change their, mm, their skill their skill set in dealing with electric cars. Tell me about that. Is there tension? I, yeah, I really don't think there is such a difference of opinion. I think dealers absolutely play a pivotal and vital role in the state's energy future. They are the link between the manufacturer and the customer. And this idea that people can just purchase the vehicle directly, I don't think that is the way that we see uh, automobile purchases going in the future. I think that dealers are uh, reorienting themselves to electric vehicle sales, as well as filling the market needs of the consumer today. So I think dealers remain a vital and important part of this uh, industry and the sector. And I'm excited about working with the automobile dealers to make sure that Hawaii is served now and in the future. Yeah, tell me that was a good question, though. It's a great question. I love it. <laughs> Give me a chance well, to tell you what I'm really thinking. Well, how do you see how do you see the industry changing going forward? I mean, the, the technology is changing. Uh, you know, uh, consumer tastes are changing. Um, the so world is changing. Need good, educated dealers and who are responsive to consumer needs, who are able to provide the best choices for Hawaii consumers. So regardless of what the products and services are, dealers play an important role in ensuring the automotive future of, of Hawaii residents. I agree, because it's still a complicated piece of machinery, and you still have to talk to somebody about making sure it runs. <laughs> that's, that's very important. Okay, uh, we're gonna do we're gonna do final summary words of wisdom now, Michael. Uh, you are first. What message you want to leave with our viewership? Uh, what do you want? What do you want to take away from this discussion? Ready? Go. Um, we are still in the early phases of a transition of our the way we move around, and we need to keep the pedal to the metal. Uh, keep working on this transition, uh, both in policy, but also in finance, in uh, infrastructure, in markets, and really thinking through how to how to bring this transition, this change about in a meaningful way that is inclusive of everybody uh, along the way, and and doesn't do it in a way that people are reluctant but actually excited to do so. And you know, I think the opportunity to do so is there. It's it's a, it's a matter of how we go about it. Um, but there's a tremendous, tremendous shift afoot, and uh, and I'm excited for it. Yeah, and it's important. It's central, isn't it? So uh, we titled this show "What's Down the Road for Electric Vehicles." What's down the road uh, for your uh, uh, your partnership, your um, um, your your um, your arrangement with your contemplated with uh, uh, with Hada. Um, well, we, 
you know, we've worked with Hata in the past and pol policy and also um, in the electric vehicle front. And we are excited that Melissa's on board and look forward to working with Hata in the future. Um, you know, obviously Hata has multiple different uh, priorities and different things and our little slice of it is electric vehicles. And so there are opportunities to partner and share in education and outreach and help uh, you know reach out to the community and educate them about options for vehicles and mobility and charging and how that all comes together because it is slightly different than what you know people are used to when they buy a gasoline car and so there is an element there of just a deeper engagement and a lot more kind of conversations that that need to happen and so um, looking for opportunities to partner with with Hada and Melissa uh, going forward and excited for for that opportunity. Yeah, okay. And for me, by the way, I, I was making notes while those kids were turning the wrenches, and I may have applied for one of those jobs you were talking about. Never mind. Um, Melissa, your final say, words. I to talk about some policies today, but it all comes back to people. Michael reminded me that his wife and I went to law school together. You are my neighbor, Jay. You know, it could not be more of a small island, no matter what island you live on. And that's really the role I think that dealers uh, recognize and identify with is working with our community. And so that's how we're going to solve our energy needs, you know, for today and the future. So thanks for having us. And just, just a word before we go is that talk about policy. What policies do you, uh, do you uh, adopt support? What, what's, what's your priorities for policy? Cause you know, it's, it's Melissa Pavlicek, but actually your middle name is P for policy. Yeah. So, <laughs> Why don't you tell us what policies are important and the priorities as far as HADA is concerned? You know, this is the second year of the legislative biennium, and we're really looking forward to um, supporting, like I said, some workforce development initiatives and ensuring that our Hawaii kids stay here and have good paying jobs. We're monitoring some of the developments on the road uses charge and want to be a key policy partner with the State Department of Transportation in implementing that. So we're not actively seeking any bills currently to um, work harder on bringing electric vehicles to Hawaii, but that is definitely something that we're looking at for the future and building our relationships with policy leaders so we can have those conversations going forward. I certainly want to circle back with you guys. You know, this is a live, uh, important priority for Hawaii, and it will determine in substantial part the future of our state and our society. Thank you so much, Michael Colon and Melissa Policy Pavlicek. <laughs> Thank you. All Thank roads you. lead back to Think Tech. All roads lead back to Hana. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, you guys. <laughs> Aloha. Aloha. Bye. <laughs>